for having me. Um, thrilled to be here. We'll go ahead and start and let um, the rest of the panelists kind of introduce themselves, tell a little bit about their role, and if we want to start in the end with Cash. Sure. You got, do I need the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Guys down there, but okay. So my name is Cash McKinley. I graduated Huntsman School Business in 2014. Uh, I took a job out of school within the medical sales profession and I've been doing that since. I now live in Idaho Falls uh, selling spinal cord stimulator implants for a company called Nevro. Um, my name is Ashley DeLong. I graduated just dropped my water bottle so that's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I graduated last May so just barely. Um, I got a job working at Adobe and I've been there for about I think five months now. Um, I really loved it. My background while I was going to school was as a marketing manager for a few dental offices. So I have a background in marketing, but I'm now in sales and I love it. I'm Jocelyn Udy. I graduated in December of 17, and then I started my role at Pinterest through the Market Star, through Market Star, uh, where I was a sales rep, starting out working with small and medium businesses. I transitioned to work with uh, Australian companies. I was one of the only reps working with Australia, and then um, in May, I was transitioned to a sales manager role. So now I run a team of 12, including an Australian team and a US SMB team. My name is Sean Harris. I uh, graduated from the Huntsman School of Business in 2016. My story is a little bit different. I played basketball up here at Utah State, and then uh, I was actually in Columbia playing basketball when I graduated. And uh, then I went to Europe and played um, in a couple of different countries. And then just recently uh, came back and stopped playing basketball and started working. And I've been at Instructure as an account development manager for the last seven months and just targeting and prospecting a lot of different companies. So it's been pretty, pretty fun. My name is Eric Joss, and uh, I graduated from Utah State here last May. So I'm the youngest person on the panel. <laughs> Our young alumni panel, right. right? Thank you. <laughs> he gave us permission to joke about that, so it's OK. <laughs> um, so I have, uh, I kind of did life a little different. Um, I flipped mine backwards. And uh, I had a 23-year career with a uh, medical manufacturing company. And uh, they, uh, after 23 years, they allowed me to graduate from the company. And uh, so as I was looking for new opportunities, um, I couldn't check that box that I had a degree. And so I looked at different schools around the country. I was, at that time, I was living in Chicago. And uh, so... I uh, came out and checked out uh, <clears throat> the Huntsman School and uh, fell in love with it. My wife actually went to school here, um, and so she, uh, she said I needed to look at Utah State. So I moved my family from Chicago um, to Cache Valley here to attend school full-time. Graduated in May, and I worked for a company called the Keyence Corporation. Um, maybe some of you have heard of them. Um, but I can talk about them a little bit later on, but I'm a, uh, I'm a sales engineer uh, for them. Great. I'm mic'd up. Well, so they gave me a pretty good introduction, but my name's Paige. I graduated last May, um, and I work for Adobe as a business development rep, so um, I work with all of our strategic travel and hospitality accounts, which has been really fun for me. Um, but let's go ahead and I want to hear a little bit about each of your daily lives, the types of companies you work with, the types of contacts you work with, um, maybe how you interact with your clients and things like that. Well, we're all in sales. All of our roles, I assume, are very vastly different. Um, I think that's something that's important to know when you're you know, looking for a job in sales. So we can start with Eric. Perfect. Um, so just to, I'll give a little bit of background on Keyence if you're not familiar with them. But uh, uh, they're actually a Japanese company. And they work in the manufacturing arena. So any type of manufacturing that you're doing, if you're doing research, so we have uh, microscopes, um, all the way down to simple sensors that just show that a product just went through an assembly line. Um, and I cover what they call the kind of some of the vision systems. So if you're doing quality checks, or you're manufacturing a lot of something and you want to make sure that it's perfect, um, then I come in and kind of help 
the engineers come up with a way that as they're manufacturing, they can have uh, a system of checks instead of having a human check that can sometimes miss th something. Um, they need to make sure every product is perfect as it goes out the door. And so I help them do that, help them eliminate uh, scrap and waste and, uh, and perfect the components that they're manufacturing. So who do I call on? Um, basically anyone from manufacturing something in their garage uh, to, uh, you guys are probably familiar with Autoleaf, um, um, any kind of medical company, any kind of food company. Um, for up here in Cache Valley, like uh, Schreiber, um, you've got uh, Gossner Cheese, uh, Pepperidge Farms. Those are all the different people that, that I call on. Um, I was actually at a uh, company yesterday here in uh, Cache Valley uh, that makes the screw implants that go into uh, your spine in surgery. And uh, of course, you know that those parts need to be perfect. And so I was helping implement something for them so they don't have to have a manual inspection. So um, I mainly work with engineers, uh, engineers that are designing new pro production lines or engineers that are trying to make improvement um, or quality engineers that are trying to uh, make sure that everything that comes into their facility is perfect. So I work with a wide range of, of people, so it's a lot of fun. Um, one day I can be in a food company and they're giving me samples to take home, which I like, um, to uh, a, a large steel manufacturer. Um, as a matter of fact, that was my day yesterday. Um, so I deal with a, a variety of people, so it's a lot of fun. I don't just uh, have certain people that I deal with all the time. Great. Well, thanks for sharing most of that one over my head a little bit, but <laughs> um, very cool. Sean? Do, you, do you get any screws at all from? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't need any of those. Yeah. Just some for your knee. Yeah. I, need, I need one of those. So I, uh, I work at Instructor, and Instructure does Canvas, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with. And uh, so I can go and change your grades to A pluses if you want. <laughs> and, uh, but I work for the other side of, of Instructure, which is Bridge. And we sell um, basically Canvas, but to businesses. So it's for all the onboarding, training, employee development side. And so we really focus on HR departments, uh, learning and development teams. And our main goal is to, to just talk to, to forward-thinking um, forward people in the industry of human resource and really get what their, what their vision is and try to implement bridge within their company um, and, and make sure that the employees are taken care of, that the employees feel like they have opportunities for growth. And so we really talk to anyone and everyone in, in human resource. And, I never knew anything about human resource before I started. <laughs> so it's been a lot of fun because I didn't know anything at all. And I, at first when I started, I was like, I'm not going to be able to learn anything about human resource. But then I started learning some more. So I think, you know, you can learn anything about any industry, no matter what, what your sales role or your sales position is. Uh, so I work at Pinterest, so we have kind of a morphed role of sales and marketing. We have two roles within our company. We have PM and AM from there, uh, so partner manager and account manager. I was a partner manager, so I was like the first person they talked to about Pinterest. Um, this was as a rep, so my first like portion of the day is checking my emails, and I checked all my accounts that I had in my book to see how their performance was going, So because really... If they aren't happy, they can shut off any day. So I wanted to make sure that they're hitting their performance goals. And then I would have around five scheduled calls a day um, and then round off the day with like doing um, reaching out and following up with people that are in my pipeline, launching campaigns for advertisers, and then working with my account manager to continue that growth of the accounts that I'd already launched. Um, the variety of SMB is really big when it comes to Pinterest. I've talked to people who our college students just starting up a campaign to companies that I fire to say their name, you would recognize them, um, big like nonprofits as well as big e-commerce uh, websites. So um, it really just kind of depends, but really just telling them why they should be on, be on Pinterest and helping them like have the solutions to what's gonna help them grow their business. So 
anything that entails in that. As a sales manager, my role is drastically different. So I'm checking in with my uh, reps every single day, um, how they're doing, reviewing their accounts, helping them work their pipeline, work their accounts, work with my counterpart, account manager, manager, and making sure that the AMs are feeling supported as well as like understanding their gaps in knowledge and how we can improve that. Um, and getting on phone with advertisers and making sure that everything's going smoothly. So a little bit different uh, compared to a rep role. Some days it's easier being a rep and some days <laughs> I really enjoy being a manager. So it just kind of depends on the day and what's going on. Um, so I, like I said before, work at Adobe. I'm a business development representative there. Um, how many of you guys know anything else that Adobe does other than the creative products? Okay, one person. See, not very many people know. I work, <laughs> so Adobe has three different clouds. They have the creative cloud, the document cloud, and the experience cloud. I work under the experience cloud, and those products are enterprise solution products. So. It, you know, wides from an analytics platform to an advertising platform to a content management platform, and there's quite a few more. And so every day I'm trying, I'm just building relationships and talking to accounts that I are named to me. And so I work in the ter um, territory central. So I work with companies in uh, Chicago and Indianapolis and Alabama. And pretty much I do the first three stages of the sales cycle. So I am just building relationships. I'm not, you know, trying to close deals. I'm just trying to understand, you know, I'm on the phone and I'm just trying to understand what their needs are. I'm trying to do pretty much as the least amount of talking I can be doing so that I can get understand, you know, what they're doing. I talk about, you know, what are their initiatives at the company, what problems are they having with their analytics solution or their advertising solutions. And as I'm having these conversations, I, you know, I'm um, trying to understand which products can I, you know, give them information on that I think could help solve these problems. So with my background in marketing, I love it because I'm just talking marketing all day. Like I have calls with the CMO of some companies and I, you know, I love my job, but definitely not close to being the CMO of a company. And so getting to have those conversations with people is so cool and understanding, you know, the issues that they're having in their restaurant because I work in way like a bunch of different verticals from manufacturing to retail and et cetera. Along with that, I'm trying to come up with I'm trying to be creative and come up with campaigns. I'm trying to do anything I can that's other than just sending an email saying, hi, I'm part of your account team. I'm like coming up with, at least trying to like these campaigns. Ashley is very creative, <laughs> like has the funnest ideas and I love them. Ashley and I work together and so yeah. she's very good at her job. <laughs> um, so is Paige. Uh, but it's like super fun. Like for instance, one of my clients is Dairy Queen. And so like trying to come up with ideas to just get them to get on the phone with me, for instance, like ordering a cake that has like Dairy Queen plus Adobe and like sending it to their CMO or like I'm trying to find little baby saddles to send to Texas Roadhouse. Like I'm trying anything. I'm like, please like just get on a phone call with me. All I want to do is hear about your company. I'm not trying to, you know, get you to sign a contract right then. But I love it because I get to be creative because I definitely have a creative side to me. Um, um, but it's it's so fun, and I work, at, you know, like I said, with Paige, and we also have, even though we're both business development representatives. Our jobs are very, very, different. very, very different. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, we have the same job. We sell, sell the same products, but um, where Ashley works in territory with a lot of companies that don't have a huge football with Adobe, she gets to be very creative. She's reaching out to a lot of different people. Um, where my role, I work in our strategic Area. So I work with our travel and hospitality accounts who spend lots of money with Adobe. They have very close relationships with a lot of our um, account executives and leadership at Adobe. So I have to do a lot more um, account management roles, making sure that they're going to events, that um, we're setting up our AEs for success for them to progress deals. I get to do a little bit of prospecting, which is fun. Um, but I think that's what's so interesting about sales is Ashley and I have the same exact job on paper, but our day-to-day -day role are very different. So but that's kind of an overview of my All right. So question, how many of you guys, juniors or, or seniors? How many seniors? All right. So this is it's like usually like senior year. It's like, okay, I'm going to start going to those things on Friday because <laughs> I need a job or I want a job. So I'm going to tell you a quick story and then I'll talk about what I do. So. I remember, and this is why it's so fun to come back and to work with 
college students is like, man, I was there and I was like, oh, I just don't need a job. It's 2014. I don't think that the job market was as good as it is right now, but it was okay. And I remember, you know, just again, like having this anxiety of, okay, I just have to have a job. I have to have a job. And so I'd come, you know, to these events and I'd look up on the stage and be like, oh my gosh, if I could just be that guy in like three or four years, right? So, and I'm not saying that I've made it at any, <laughs> any way, but I'm telling you that you guys are doing the right things, right? You guys are here on a Friday to learn about sales, to talk about edu furthering your education and your knowledge and experience. So good for you guys uh, for being here. So that's the first thing. Second thing, uh, what I do, so I sell spinal cord stimulator implants. So he talked about the screws. So person who has a bad back, they go through conservative treatment. And then at some point, if they have a back surgery, most of the time, well, you hope that that helps them, right? That that furthers them along in their life and that they have a good quality of life, but many times it doesn't. So after back surgery, the patient works with pain management and hopefully they don't get on too much pain medication, but that, that's been the issue that's happened over the last two or three years. There's been this massive you know, opiate crisis. And so there's new therapies that have come out really in the last two to three years to offer pain relief without introducing a drug to a patient. Um, so I work for Nevro, launched in 2015, and Nevro, it's high frequency spinal cord stimulation. So the patient has probably had back surgery, they didn't get the relief that they wanted, they failed conservative treatment, they get us two wires in the epidural space, so we put two wires on top of the spinal, con spinal cord, not in the spinal cord, and then a battery goes underneath the skin. So what's bananas about this job is that after the implant is done, you're then working with the patient. So my first three years out of college was working selling spine screws. So it was you're going to the procedures and you're, you know, helping the scrub techs and you're helping to, you know, answer questions and make sure everything that is needed there for the case. And now it's you are implanting the device. You're not, I'm not, but I'm in the room. And then after you're working with these patients for 10 years. So my day is calling on a physician to promote, educate, uh, working with local staff in the clinic, working with the hospital, with contracting and making sure pricing's in place. And then it's answering phone calls, meeting with patients, reprogramming patients, talking about their pain, talking about their function. So it is uh, never, I, I didn't even know it existed uh, when I was a college student, but it's, it's been awesome, so. Great, well, um, like Sterling said, this is your panel, so I have a few questions that I can ask if it gets a little quiet in here, but um, we wanna know what you guys wanna know from us, so do we have, can I still one of your guys' mics? <laughs> Obviously, I don't do this often. Um, go ahead and say your name, major, question. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. <laughs> Hi. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Hi. I'm Jordan Bell. I know a few of you. I'm studying human resources. I'm in the master's program here. Um, probably the thing that I'd like to ask you is, you know, you, you said you were just in our shoes here either a couple years ago or last semester. What are some things that we should develop now so that we're ready for those career opportunities when they come? Um, so I was actually just up here recruiting and something that you start to realize and um, I feel like I wanna be like pretty candid about is you guys are amazing and you're standing out. Like the fact that you're here today really sets you apart from everybody else who you know chose to sleep in and not come, which is fine. I had many of those days, I still do. Um, <coughs> But you, you start to talk to people and you, you know, as a human, you start to doubt. You're like, oh, like, I know there's so many amazing people out there. Like, maybe I'm not gonna be able to get this job. I don't know if I'm qualified enough. Um, and I feel like we're just, as humans, we tend to feel that way about ourselves. And it's, it's so not true. I talked to so many people and I, when I got my job, I, to be honest, I didn't even apply to work at Adobe. Um, I was going through kind of, you know, a crisis my senior year. I was like, where am I going to work? What am I going to do? I've worked really hard in marketing. That's what my background's in. I'm not going into sales. Um, and I had conversations with Paige and with Dr. Bone, and I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And when the job for Adobe was on the table, I honestly was like, I don't think I'd get that job. 
I was like, I'm not going to apply. Plus it's sales. Like there's no way that they would hire me, which is dumb to think that way. But you know, I, you know, everyone has confidence issues. And at the time I was, you know, I was like, it's Adobe. Like that place is awesome. They're not going to hire, you know, this girl from Logan. And I ended up not applying, and the guy who, um, Jake Rennie, who had come and talked to us in the pro sales group called me, and he's like, why didn't you apply? Like, you know, tell me about it. And I ended up getting an interview, and at that point, I was like, I want this job so badly. And let me tell you, in interviews, um, it's so obvious who wants the job, who's willing to put in the effort, and who is just like, I have, a, I have a diploma and that's going to get me this job because yes, you're here and you need, you know, to go to school because you learn so much, you can network, but just be yourselves in interviews. I feel like often we get so nervous and are like, I want them to like me. I want to make sure that I'm answering these questions correctly, but the manager or the person who's interviewing you just wants to get to know you and they just want to have candid, normal conversations. They don't want to hear about what you think they want to hear about. I remember when I had my interview at Adobe, um, I, you know, the interview was like, the questions were over and I was like, okay, like I'm gonna be honest, I want to work here, what do I need to do to do it? Like I was like, I'm not gonna act like, oh, it's like one of my choices, I was like, this is it. So if you don't give me the job now, I'll be back again next year and the year after that and the year after that because this <laughs> is where I want to be. And I feel like, you know, I, I feel like I've gone on, but just, realize that you guys are so capable and so knowledgeable and brilliant and you're on the right track because you're here this morning you want to be in a successful position and just realize that not everybody is like that and as long as you are being true to yourself and being aggressive and just trying to do everything you can to be successful like you'll be set like you will get a job you'll be able to move forward just make sure that you know that you have to work hard to do that, and you're already, you know, putting in the work to do that. But that's my thought. Anyone else? And, and I'll just, I'll just kind of add to that, and and that's exactly right. Is uh, don't undersell yourself. Um, the the job that I have with Keyence, I would never in a million years think that I'd be working with a bunch of engineers. Um, and, but it's because of the Huntsman School and the programs here going through um, everything that you've done to this point, you, you, you're on a higher level than you think you are. Um, and you will be very successful. Um, I would have never even applied for this job uh, previous to coming here to the Huntsman School. Because um, it just wasn't in my comfort zone. It's not something I wanted to do. But I really stretched. Um, and Keyence is uh, very particular um, about who they hire. They do a lot of matrix in how they set things up. And there was, uh, I believe the count was somewhere around 44,000 applicants. Um, and only 115 got hired. And I'm the only one in all of Utah. But when I talked to the recruiters, they said, we have never had a university like Utah State. Um, they didn't, I think uh, they interviewed 40, 50 people here. And uh, they said they offered over 30% of them positions with the company. Now, unfortunately, and I'm going to get on a soapbox for a minute. <laughs> Um, shame on those students for not taking the job because they didn't want to move out of Utah. And I am a huge proponent, move out of the state, go have your experience for two or three years, put all that on your resume, then move back if you want. Um, but they, Keyence loved Utah State. They said, we've never had the caliber of students so interested in, their, in improving themselves. They're usually, they said, when we meet with students, they're like, okay, do I get the job? Um, and so don't, don't undersell yourself. Um, you guys can compete with anyone out there. Just move out of the country. Don't just move out of the state. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> That's what I did. Yeah. No, yeah. I think just be confident. Be confident in yourself. You know, you want to 
there's, I think that's the biggest thing. When I, when I took the position at Instructure, you know, I didn't know exactly how I was going to be able to do the job, but I knew that if there was a job out there, I could do it. So I think that's the biggest thing is just be confident. You're not, at the end of the day, when you're going to interview, yeah, you're competing against other people, but they just want to know. I think the biggest thing when you go to interview is you want to know, am I going to like working with this person? Because they're going to be working with you. The person who's interviewing you is most likely going to be working with you on a day-to-day -day basis. So am I going to like working with this person? And are they going to get the job done? That's really what they want to know. And so if you're confident that you're going to get the job done and that you're likable enough, that you're not a bad person, then, then you can have confidence going into any interview. And, and just right now, like, what, what can you do? Just keep getting to know people. You know, that's what you need to be doing is, is you know, I, I don't know how uh, you got the, the interview with Keons with that many applicants, but maybe they're, you know, it's easier when you know somebody that works at a company. So keep networking, keep getting to know people. The more people you know, the easier it is to get that, the application on the top of the stack. Sorry, I'll add on to this. Ditto for everything. <laughs> um, and also, like, don't be afraid to pivot. And when you pivot, like, just go all in and be figuring out. So I actually didn't graduate from the Huntsman College. I graduated from the College of Agriculture and Agribusiness. And I was coming up on my last semester, and I said, Professor Bone, I, like, scheduled a time during the summer and said, I want to go into sales. You're the pro sales guy. Help me out. Um, and then I competed in the Pinterest sales competition. Pinterest doesn't have anything to do with agriculture, in case you didn't know. <laughs> so it is very, like, very drastic from what I'm doing. So maybe you're in HR, maybe you're in marketing, maybe you're in business admin. Like, go out and find the opportunities that are going to build your resume. Be okay to move out of state. I was definitely open to that, but husband's still going to school here. Um, but, like, find those opportunities that maybe you'll have to make a little bit of a sacrifice. Maybe you won't. Um, I drive to Ogden every day. That's kind of a sacrifice from here at Logan. Um, some people, it's a pay cut, but just like be willing to go all in the, those first like two to three years after school and it will open up opportunities. We've had, um, I think we're on like our sixth or seventh person that's moved from Ogden to go work for Pinterest Direct. So it's a really great opportunity there, but also like you can have that opportunity wherever else. I'm, I mean, I think Pinterest is pretty great, but uh, <laughs> like, just be open to like sacrificing, diving in, and pivoting. So, awesome. Well, totally agree with all of that. I'll add one more thing: the opportunities available in the Huntsman School are seriously unparalleled to any university. And I've talked to a lot of people that we work with, or even friends that live down in Salt Lake City, and like went to the U. And I tell them about the things that I was involved at, or involved in at Utah State, and they're just appalled that that's even something that's available. Um, so definitely take advantage of the opportunities, even if it's something that is maybe a little bit out of your comfort zone or something that you might not have thought that you were interested in. You'll gain so much from every yes versus every no that you have here. Like if I would have told myself in high school that I would have done sales competitions in college, I probably would have laughed at myself and been like, no way will you do that. But it was one of the best things I ever did. So um, any other questions? Hi, um, my name is Natalie. I'm a senior and going into marketing. Um, so I, I like where you're saying how the Huntsman School, they, there are so many opportunities here and that is something that I have been realizing um, as I'm kind of getting ready to graduate here. So my issue is that um, I've received a lot of really good offers and th there's two in particular where um, there's one place where I'm working currently and they've offered me a position there and everything that they're offering me, I'm just like, it sounds wonderful and it sounds like something I would love to do and I'm passionate about it. Um, but I'm also reaching out and just seeing what else is out there because I, I just, I don't know. It's really hard for me to figure out what I want. Like you were saying how as soon as you interviewed um, with Adobe, you were like, this is the job I want. So how did you come to that decision where you knew that the companies you work for, that that was where you wanted to be. I have the mic, I'll start. So um, I, the reason why I went into agribusiness was because I've really loved the small businesses and like helping them be successful and grow to like bigger companies and just making um, those small, the owners of those companies to be successful. 
that translated. So when I was thinking agribusiness, I was thinking farmers and helping these people just like grow their farms, which is like cool, but um, there's not a lot, you know, like that's a really small industry, like to be able to really grow myself and, and be successful. So what I found is that when it translated over to Pinterest was that I'm helping mom and pop shops, small startups to the bigger businesses. And like really my, the reason why I enjoy my job and the reason why I enjoyed agribusiness was because it was small and medium businesses and helping them grow and be successful. So I would say like find the thing that makes you you and like what makes you excited and you'll be able to find that company that works with you and then you'll like going to work. You'll like getting on the phone and telling people about this amazing product that's going to help them like grow their business. So that's my thoughts. Um, I feel like what I'm going to say lines up perfectly with that. I feel like oftentimes, and I know I might have a different perspective, but I always tell myself that I will never leave a company that I love for you know any amount of money. Like I just don't think that you should take a job based off of that it's a bigger offer because what I feel like you don't realize, and I know for sure I didn't realize, is you're like, oh yeah, it'll be my full time job, like you know, when I get there, it'll be really fun. And I love my job, but let me tell you, it's full time. Like you are there from morning until night. And that's like, it's not like college where you get a little bit change of scenery. Like that's what you do. And so if you don't love your job, if you don't find value and it doesn't like fulfill whatever your passion in life is, it'll be really hard for you to love to get up at six in the morning to get ready and go to work. And so my thing for why I decided to go with Adobe and is because my one like passion and what's most important to me in life is that I feel like I'm adding value to those around me, the company that I work for, and I'm, I'm helping make a difference. And I felt like at Adobe, not only could I help do that in my job because I'm so passionate about marketing and so I can help companies who are like, you know, this isn't working for me, we're, we're losing money, our ROI is not where we need it to be, like I could lose my job, I'm able to be like, listen, like I have this product, yes, it's an investment, but like I really feel confident that it can help add value to your company. And so that fulfills it as well as Adobe as a whole. And there's so many other companies out there like this. They add value to the community and they allow you to add value in so many places. Like for instance, if you donate money to a charity, um, they, they match it. And it doesn't matter how much it is, they'll match it. And I feel like to work for a company that cares so much about the people that are there, the people who don't even work for them and are willing to do what they can to help make a difference, that's a company I want to work for. And so based off of what she said and how I feel, like, don't choose a company based off of a paycheck. Don't choose a company based off of the title or the, you know, the name of the company, choose a company based off of your passions and what you feel like is going to make you feel fulfilled every day that you go to work because it is every day. It's not, you know, five hours, three times a week. Like it is every day. And so you need to make sure that you're being fulfilled personally. And dovetailing off Ashley, because we do work together. Um, I think a lot of people get set on, okay, this is my the job that I'm choosing right out of college and they get really stuck in this bubble of like that one job and they forget to think okay but what's what's next after that and Ashley and I've worked at Adobe for four or five months now and we've had two different roles since we've been there um, so your first job might be great but that is your first job out of college and so the opportunity to have um, you know somewhere else to go and a clear path of how you're going to get promoted and what you're going to move on to I think it's really important um, and culture as well. Like, I had some experience working some other places, and you have to, like, culture is kind of a buzzword, but you have to figure out what that culture is for you and what's really important. Um, for me specifically, I'm 22 years old. I didn't want to be, like, working from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. at night. That just did not sound fun to me. And so being at a place where people valued, okay, come to work, get your stuff done, be productive. But once that's over, go home and have a life or take a Friday off and go. Like I went to New York City last week and I took the Friday off and I took the morning off on Monday and came in a little bit late. But having that sort of freedom was something that was really important to me. Um, just based off that, what she said real quick, like go and see if you can shadow these companies because 
I would not have as much fun at work if I didn't love the people I work with. Like working with Paige and, you know, and I have a new friend, Chris, who's from BYU. Didn't think I'd mm. like anyone from BYU. We, we have to love him very hard. Like, um, <laughs> but like you just like, they're who you're with every day. It's who you spend time with. And I love the team I work on. I'm also 22 and um, our team has a wide variety of ages. They all give us a hard time because... We're, we're babies. Because we're babies, you know, and we both have short blonde hair. Like, you know, they they called us interns for the beginning of our job there. And so, so about three weeks ago. Yeah, so about three <laughs> weeks ago. Even the uh, chef downstairs thought that we were interns. So we've moved up in the company. They know that we're not interns anymore. Um, but just get to know the people if the people really make your job also. I have to push back on some of the things you guys say. Okay. No. That's okay. He does have more experience than us, so. No, no. <laughs> maybe, so, so I'm Eric. You may be a little older than me, a little bit. But <laughs> oh. I will say, it's funny because you, and Eric, I want you to chime in here. Like, you know, you, there is something about, like, the millennial culture, and I'm a millennial, too, and so are you, and so are all of us in this I'm room. I'm actually not okay? a millennial. You're an, okay. I'm a Gen Z. See, I don't even know when that <laughs> line stops. Okay. Hey, so. young. So, but, but what happened? So, so this is really super interesting stuff. So, you know, I love the idea of following passion and finding a job and a culture that you love. Those are all really, really good things. Um, the pushback is this, is, is that your guys are coming out of college with some experience, but not much, right? And for you guys to, first of all, you guys are like, I don't even know what I want to do. I don't know what I'm passionate about. Oh, I'm passionate about lifting weights and... Uh, you know, so maybe I'm going to go work for a weightlifting company or a nutrition company, or I'm going to go into sports medicine or something. So it's like finding your passion is a really hard thing to do, especially when you're a college student and you haven't had any work experience outside of what you've done till now. And so there's a book, and I was telling him about this book, Cal Newport, So Good They Can't Ignore You. And this book, I read this book, my first job I had, and this author, he's fantastic. He wrote another book called Deep Work. I get it on Audible. It's really easy to listen to. It's this idea that to get the job that you ultimately will love, it's not luck and it's not maybe finding the right culture or the right fit. Maybe those things do play into it. But really, when you look at people like, dude, that guy has a cool job and a cool life and he's kicking butt and I would like to be somewhere where he is someday. It's a lot more becoming so good and adopting this apprentice mindset. You know, in the book, you'll, you'll read it, right? This apprentice mindset where you're taking this first role or your first any, you know, you guys are starting at the bottom and really that first job is going to be starting at the bottom and dedicating yourself and learning it and getting so good at it and more and more opportunities are going to come versus this idea that, oh man, I hate this job, it sucks and I'm not passionate about it. That's going to describe your first jobs, unless you're really lucky. And I'm sorry, I don't want to be pessimistic. No, no this right? is great. But it's, it's important to have so many different opinions because we're 22. We're new to the industry, and he's been in it. You know, he graduated in 2014, and so I think that hearing we're still blind, you know. No, but, and have fun and, and be happy, right? But, but I guess the idea of, man, I really want to find a job I really am going to be excited about and love right out of college, that, that is like thinking like this deep. You know what I mean? It's really, it's, it's more like, okay, I'm going to get a job that's going to develop me, it's going to make me do hard things that I'm going to get this great experience from, and then I'm going to be able to pivot, pivot, pivot. Because your first job, I first, my first job out of college, medical device, it was like, if there's like A company, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I was like an H. Like you would never, you, no one in this room would know what that first medical device company was. And that's kind of the way that it is in medical device. And then maybe you, you, then you're really good and then you get, maybe you get up to like a B company or a C company and then you're really good and then you get a promotion. And so it's not this idea that, you know, man, I want to work for this company right away. It's this idea that, okay, I want to get the experience, get the knowledge get to the point where I can qualify myself. It's a, just a totally different mindset, right? It's like, oh, I want to find a passionate job, job I'm passionate about and feel good. It's like, okay, good luck. And maybe you will, right? The other approach is I'm going to take a job where I'm going to develop the skills necessary because I know that to get that end point that I'm going to love, it's going to be because I'm so good they can't ignore you. It sounds cheesy, but it, it's, it's so right. 
I'll say something too. So, yeah, I, I, I think I lean more towards what you're saying as well. I, I played basketball overseas and that was like my dream job, you know? But there was still every day I had to do drills and practice. There's still every day I had to run lines to stay in shape. So there's, there was things about my job that I didn't like, you know? And that was my dream job. So I think that there's always gonna be things, no matter what, that you don't like, but you're, that you're doing because it is what you like and you're engaged in what you wanna do. So I think I, I kind of take from both sides, right? Like you wanna be engaged in what you're doing on a daily basis. If you're so, just so far away from, you know, disconnected from everything that you're doing, then it might be time to, to change your job. But if it's like, okay, this is what I'm doing because I'm developing the skills to get to where I want to get to, and this job is going to help develop me, and it's going to be a grind, then it, it might be worth it to take that job. And obviously, you know, I would look for something that's going to give you growth. That's what I would look for, a company that's going to have a lot of growth, opportunities for growth, or maybe the company itself is growing. And so that's going to give you an opportunity to grow as well. So I think that for me, when, when you see that there's a company that has opportunities for growth, when you can grow and develop yourself as, as an employee and really gain relevant skills in today's world, then that's what I would look for in a job. You know? And that's what, you know, when you're weighing these two options or multiple options, I would think about, okay, where am I gonna really grow? What's gonna take me to where I wanna get to? And there's gonna be things that you don't like that you're gonna have to do. And, and that's just part of working. You know, and but doing those things is going to make you better. Doing overcoming those challenges is going to make you better, and and then you'll get used to those things, and it won't be it won't be nearly as as bad as what it sounds like. I I think you're at a big advantage where you've worked for a company that makes an offer. Most people don't have that. Um, I'm kind of a, a checklist type of person, um, so. Uh, is there is there forward movement in the company? Check. Uh, do I like the culture of the company? That's a little harder to decide. You you kind of know that with the company that you're with, um, but trying to understand the culture and that's where in the interview process you need to be interviewing also. Uh, I'm not sure who said it, but uh, you know it needs to be a fit on both sides that you're a fit with their company and they're a fit with what you're looking for. Um, then you start looking at other things, you know, what, what are the benefits like? What, what's the education process, uh, which was a big thing for me. Um, you know, what kind of training do you have in your company? Is it, I get training for 24 hours and then I'm on my own. Um, do they have ongoing? And so, um, I, I think it's important to just kind of make a list of everything that you want to find and then as you're interviewing, does, does that company that you just interviewed with, do they check those boxes? And if they don't check all of them, okay, can I live with that? Um, but think of yourself, okay, could I work for this company for five, six, 10, 20 years, which anymore I don't think people really do that. Um, Back in the olden days, I guess when I started, you did that. Uh, but nowadays, everyone just, oh yeah, I work for a company for two or three, four years, and then I move on to the next. Um, which is really hard for me to do, to think, oh my gosh, I'm only gonna do this for five years? Because I don't think that way. I think, man, I'm gonna work for these guys for 25 years. Um, so I, I think it's just, what does your gut say? And does it meet some of your criteria? And you, so make sure you have criteria. If you don't have criteria going in, then any job will work. But, uh, you know, for me, forward progression up the company, um, how fast does that happen? The great thing about Keyence, and that was one of the questions that I really drilled into them, is how fast can I move up within the organization? Give me a timeline. Um, and they have an amazing program. Matter of fact, they encourage forward uh, progression. Uh, I was like, "Whoa, check!" Um, you know, so just y you got to figure out what what are what are the important things to you in that job. And I definitely agree. Your first job might not be your dream job, but it should be a stepping stone to the next job in the next position. So always be networking. 
and um, I'll always, you know, keep your 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 mind open to to other opportunities. Like I said, Keens was definitely not on my radar. Um, most people can't even spell the name. <laughs> I'd never heard of them until they came to the university. Um, so through the companies that come here, they're great networking. So I think the consistent theme there is opportunity for growth. At least that's what I heard. Um, it's your job you go to every day and you want to know what, what's going to get you to your moonshot, right? Um, any other questions? Feel free to direct them towards people on the panel or you know, we can all continue answering them. Hello, I'm Ben. I'm a senior studying management information systems. Um, so one of the problems that I kind of feel or the, you know, the pressures that we feel as a, as a senior looking for a job uh, is to find a job in an industry that I know a lot about, which seeing as how I don't have much work experience, there's not a whole lot of industries that I am an expert in. So I guess, you know, kind of specifically for Cash, which is a really cool name, by the way, like, did you have a background in medical equipment or is that something y'all learned on the job? And for the rest of you, did you guys have a background in your industries or is this something that you learned on the job or how did you guys go about that process? So I, uh, I did not, and I would never, I couldn't, I, I cannot, I couldn't watch on TV like a needle going into skin, like, you know, like those hospital shows, like, oh, I can't even watch that. So, uh, no, never would have thought I would be standing in the OR for the past five years in, you know, big open procedures, and blood, and I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. But uh, I guess to answer your question is, I didn't know, but then I, we didn't talk about money yet. And, and maybe we shouldn't, but it was like. No, actually, we're in sales. We can talk about money. Yeah, I, I, talk, I took my first. <laughs> I give you permission. <laughs> I had a software. I was like, dude, I love technology. It was a company called Workday. I'm sure they still come around here as well. And uh, I had an offer, and I accepted the offer. And anyways, and then it kind of <clears throat> came down to medical devices, a little more money. Maybe it checked some more of those boxes. Um, but I would say that if you, you're in MIT, your management information systems. Is that right? Yeah. Oh man, so it's like, dude, you have got a lot of options. I mean, that, as far as a major goes, if I was gonna go back to college today, I'd pick MIS, uh, as far as in the business school, just because you are, I mean, I don't think that that's something you have to totally worry about. Do you love technology? Yeah. You love computers? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's- You got every company. Yeah, man. <laughs> so, I, and I think that that's, you know, obviously you're probably pretty good at that stuff too. And so you're gonna, you're gonna have good opportunities. And then it's that same like apprentice mindset, right? Like again, get the book. You know, he talks about computer programmers and coders and how these guys are able to pro progress, progress, progress and end up where they are. And it's not because, you know, they're really smooth talkers or it's because they work their butts off and they know their stuff, so. Um, I feel like you don't have to feel like just because you know a lot about an industry, you have to stay in it. I have uh, like four years of background in dental. I know dental really well. I worked as a marketing coordinator and then a marketing manager. And I love the dental industry. But I feel like you can always find things, like you can learn an industry while, yes, I think it, if you find a job in that position, like I feel like it's whatever you feel most comfortable with. But don't feel like just because you understand one industry better, you should stay in that industry. Um, I'll share like a quick short story. And Paige always hears me talk about it. I am... Uh, I love my dad and he is a really good example to me and is very smart and driven and um, when I was born he sold fish and tackle like he went around and sold worms to you know people trying to get them to you know buy worms like such a hard job and then he worked in the newspaper industry and in the nonprofit industry and fast forward 20 years later he got into the dental industry also and he's now the CEO of a multi-million dollar company and he had not even slightly a clue that he wanted to be in the dental industry. He just knew what he was good at and knew that he could apply it in the position he was given. And like he went from selling fish and tackle to all these different industries to now in dental and he loves it. So I feel like never think that one industry is what you need to stay in. Like you have the skills you're good at, just like he said, you, you know what you like to do and you can always under, learn a new industry. Just use those tools to grow inside of that industry? Um, when I got my job at Pinterest, um, I, the only Pinterest digital ads experience I had was the first Pinterest sales competition we had here. 
And I look back and I'm like, I did not know a single thing of what I was talking about. All I knew is that Pinterest was great. I love Pinterest. Everyone should use Pinterest. Um, and then I went through, we had, so I was one of a hundred people when I started, like we had a big cohort that started. And so we had a really long in-depth training. And so that was very fortunate for me. Um, but we had Ben Sieberman, the CEO of Pinterest phone in. And he said, the best thing I want you to do is go out and fail quickly. Cause you, then you're going to learn. So like you can have six, eight weeks, nine weeks of training, but like you just got to get out um, and learn and don't be afraid of failing, but learn from your mistakes. So I have a question for all of you. Um, I think something like a buzzword when you're in school is like network, meet people. Um, and sometimes you go to events, you're like, I don't even know how to talk to these people or what they want me to ask them or different, you know, things that you could say to them that might make them might, might make you stand out. So uh, from each of you, something like a good networking tip, good way to get people to remember you or have good intelligent conversations with them. Um, I would say go to the events. That's like That's the a first good start. step. Really um, good. That was something that I didn't do too well. You guys are step above. You're here. Um, but you need to go to them, um, whether it be um, even when you're working, like I had Lucid Chart came and I was like, oh, hey, because they were teaching us about the processes and about their product. And I connected with them on LinkedIn, but I had a lot of stuff that day I could have gone and, and done, but I took the time out even just like within my work day. So like go to the events where you can be talking with people and like continually networking. That's a really good question because I, I've asked myself that a lot. Like how do I leave a lasting impression it was easier when I had a flat top to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the best way is to, like if you're gonna go somewhere and there's gonna be people from different businesses, uh, I think if you know something about them already. So like if I would've come and I'd've been like, oh, Keon, that's a great Japanese company. He would've remembered me forever, yep. but he'll forget me now. <laughs> so I think, you know, the same thing, like, it, you know, if I were to look up each person and it's everyone puts their, LinkedIn profile out there. So if you look up something and you can look up a quick fact, it takes like two minutes to go on LinkedIn, look up their company, look up what they do. If you know you're gonna meet someone or you have a possibility of meeting people and you can just talk to something about what they do or what their company's doing, what, might, what they might be going through, people are gonna remember you. And I think that's one way, they'll be like, who are you again? And so I think, I think that's something to, to do your homework on people. Yeah, there's a big difference between like who are you and, oh, you're so-and-so from this company or something like that. Um, I'll say two things. To echo off of what he said, I, that's so true. I was just talking with um, one of our managers the other day, and he said that a huge thing he looks for in interviews is if someone's looked at his LinkedIn and knows something about him. Because you think, oh, everybody does that. Like, everybody does their research. No one does that. No one goes and looks. No one knows you know, who they're talking with previous job was or what they do. But one thing that helped me in my interview at Adobe is we had to do a role play. And I looked up who I was going to do the role play with. And I went on his LinkedIn and I found a paper that he wrote on the, you know, the five things that you need to do during a sales play. And I was like, all right, like, I'm going to write these down. I'm going to understand like what he feels is most important. And I finished my role play and he was like, so like, tell me why you did these few things. And I was like, well, I read your blog post and I, you know, and I know that these are some things that you think are very key. And he like, he, you can't argue with that. You can't be like, uh oh, you know, he's like, wow, I'm impressed you read that and you listened and did a good job. So I feel like do your research. And on top of that, something that I felt like helped calm my nerves when I networked and talked with people is just try and build a friendship. Like you're not, you know, they're not, they're still a human being just because they have a job you want to have and or out of college, it doesn't mean that, you know, you should be intimidated by them. Like, just be a friend. I feel like that's something that, you know, you're a salesperson. You're trying to build relationships. Just have a conversation and be normal. Don't come in, like, immediately, like, so, tell me, like, tell me about the salary. Tell me about this, you know. Just try and get to know them as a person because that's who they'll remember, the person who tried to get to know them and didn't just try and get a job, if that makes sense. Do you guys know Derek Tuttle right here, second row? So here's a good, this is perfect for networking. So I get a text from Derek on September 12th. I didn't reply back. 
sorry. <laughs> I got a text from Professor Bone, because I'm sure Derek was in his ear. Yeah, I'm talking, to, reaching out to this guy. He hasn't texted me back yet. I get another text uh, about a week and a half later, and then I didn't reply. But I think I called him the next day. <laughs> so that's bad on me. It's just been super, super busy. But it's that squeaky wheel. Do you guys know there's another guy, Jeff uh, Manwaring? I said I, I keep bringing this guy up. So he was a Utah State student, graduated like 2016, and uh, he wanted to get into medical device. And he had it in his mind, I want to do med device. And so Professor Bone put him in contact with LinkedIn, and he would like ping me, we'd text back and forth, ping me again, and dude, that guy stayed on it. And I was like, this guy, he's not going away. So then I connected him with Cynthia's, uh, because that's, that's how it works, right? Oh, hey, hey I got a guy, Cynthia's. And uh, so then he goes and he interviews with Cynthia's, and he, I'm sure he was doing that. He ended up with a killer job out of college with Stryker, uh, which is, I mean, again, like that's like an A company. I started with like an <laughs> F company. He started with an A company. Uh, and so right here, I mean, I was able to connect him to a guy in Boise who's looking for a rep, and timing's not, doesn't seem to be working out, but it's that idea. It's like squeaky wheel, man. And you, you, if you can get people on the phone and you can keep persisting, because people like that, you know, and they, they do. And so you guys might feel like, oh, I feel annoying. I'm sending him a second message and he hasn't texted me back. It's like, no, forget that. Like, get after it. That's super helpful. There's one thing I read on LinkedIn, same thing as a salesperson, like, and I love it and I think about it every day is you keep messaging them until you get an answer. Doesn't matter if it's a no, doesn't matter if it's a yes, you keep sending messages until you get your answer. And some people don't feel the same way and that's okay. But as long as they're relevant messages, you're not just sending like anything. But I feel like when it comes to getting a job, getting a sale, like just keep sending them relevant, good intellectual things until you either get a yes or a no. Because until you get not like you have to get something before you give up in my opinion. Or you send them, A, I'm busy, B, I'm not interested, or C, I got eaten by an alligator, and then they have to say something. Um, my one thing is people love to talk about themselves. If you don't have anything to say to them or anything that you know about them, just ask them because people just love to talk about themselves, and they can do it for hours. Um, I have one more question, then we can maybe take one more from the crowd. But um, something with sales is you often hear, face a lot of rejection, a lot of no. I mean, sales is a career where 75% of your life is no and 25% is yes, and that's really good. Like, if you're getting yes 25% of the time, that's awesome. Um, but talk a little bit about how you handle rejection and being told no and um, that sort of thing. Um, you or pressure of having yeah. a quota, different things like that. Yeah. Um, pressure of quota is... I want to make money, so I'm going to go out and do what I need to to make money. So if someone tells me no, I'm like, okay, I'll keep you in my back pocket because no usually means not yet or I didn't quite understand or something else is going on. Um, so I always like keep them in my pool if I'm going to follow up in a month. Um, but then I would just move on. Like it's, it's a numbers game. It comes to it um, and just like really understanding your drive. Um, if you need to pick up the phone, like do what you need to send them a cake, you know, I don't know, like, <laughs> just figure out, like, what you need to, to really do that, and find the satisfaction in it, so, like, using creativity, or mine was, like, finding businesses that I actually cared about their mission, and, like, what they're doing, so, and that's not always, like, uh, something that's available to you to do, but it's something that I always try to incorporate, so. I always wanted to understand why there's a no. So they'll say no. Is it no, you're not interested? No, you don't understand. Or no, have I not helped you understand how I can help you? So um, I usually like to kind of dig in and understand why there's a no. And sometimes it's just like, oh, well, no, right now I don't need anything, but I may need something tomorrow. But you took it as, oh, no, uh, door's closed. They don't want to talk to me. Uh, it, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I like to dig in and completely understand why there's a no. No, there's no application. I, I can't use it. Um, or no, we just can't afford to buy it at this time, but we will later. So I, I think just kind of understanding what that no is. And sometimes you just haven't added enough value. 
um, I've actually had times where I got a no and I'm like, they don't even know what I'm talking about yet. And, uh, and so um, I, I have to add some value. It, it can't be just a, a one-way street where I'm trying to just pull everything from them. Um, but if I'm adding value, then they're, they're more open. Um, I recently had someone who uh, told me three times they didn't want to meet with me, but I wouldn't hang up. And they didn't hang up. So I just kept talking. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I got a meeting with them and totally solved an application. I just, I just had to keep asking questions and, and trying to add value. Yeah, I don't think a no is permanent. Right? It's, it's, a, it's an objection, mm -hmm. and it's how you handle that objection. And I think, yeah, you're going to hear no so many times. It's not, I don't think that's even an issue. You're, it's, you're just going to get used to that. So, you know, in sales, you're going to get told no a lot. You're going to have to face the pressure of a quota. But I think the biggest thing with the quota is just is kind of just forgetting what the quota is, because then you might act. You might just like, sorry, you'll start acting desperate if you start thinking about your quota and how you got to hit your number. So you got to make this sale. So I would just more focus on what the person in front of you and what their issues are what's their initiatives and, and how you can help them. And if you believe in your product or your service, then it shouldn't really matter if someone tells you no, because you still believe in what you're selling. And that's the, that's the biggest issue. If you don't believe in what you're selling, then you might need to change companies. But if you believe in what you're selling and if you think it actually works and, you, and you've seen that it works over and over again, then it's not a big issue if someone tells you no, because I agree, they either either I haven't done my job correctly in explaining or they haven't given me at the time of the day. You know, it's the old adage of when you walk into a, a retail store or you walk into a department store and they say, you know, you come in looking for something and, and they come and say, oh, can I help you? And you say, no, I'm just looking around. It's just, it's your first reaction to say no. And it's everyone else's first reaction to say no right away. It's just we're programmed to say no, I don't want, I don't need any help. And so, uh, so that's just, I think, if you can handle those objections and really, and really dive into you know, what's, what are you saying when you say no, I think that's the bigger issue. Is there anything? Um, just to kind of echo what both Eric and Sean said, if you think about it, like you know, a salesperson's calling you and they're like, can I have 10 minutes of your time? You're like, nope, probably not. Like you just, like you said, it's initial. You just wanna say no. And I think it's so important to understand that people don't want to have conversations in life and sales unless they feel like you're giving them value. So a lot of the times when I get like an email that's like, no, or no, please take me off your mailing list, I'm like... Ashley yeah. and I were laughing about our emails we had in our inbox this morning. Man, I get so many no's, and I'm like, come on, this message was so good. I can't believe you said no to it. Um, and I always say, like, you know, thank you so much for replying back to me. I know that you're very busy. While you did say no, may I ask, you know, what would be relevant for me to send you next time? Or give me some more relevant information so I can make sure that I'm inviting you to the right events that can help add value to you and your company. And I just make sure to understand why did you say no to me? Because sometimes, like for instance, one of the sales reps I work with sent a LinkedIn message. Really good LinkedIn message. He gets a response at 702 and it says no. He gets a response at 7.07, and then it goes, actually, can you tell me more about it? And so, like, people, like you said, initial response, just no, please leave me alone. There was just understand why they said no before you give up on them and then put them in your back pocket because while it can be intimidating, and I thought I was going to have an issue with it when I started because I'm like, you know, why did you say no? You just realize that you're passionate in your products. So you know it can help them. Keep asking and understanding why they said no. As for the quota, yeah. <laughs> super nerve-wracking, always will be. But if you, like Sean said, just do your job and try your hardest to be good at it, you'll always hit your quota. As long as you're putting in the hard work and not just trying to hit the number, you're just trying to do your job well, you, you know, most likely all the time will hit your quota because it just takes hard work. But And some luck. <laughs> so, so you guys have the sales jackets on. How many of you guys raise a hand or saying, I'm going to get my first job in sales? Sit guys with the sales jackets on. 
<laughs> so here's what, and this is, this is true, depending on, so these guys have, I mean, you have hundreds of customers, right? Yeah, I have like 200. 200 counts. 400. 400. I have, I have, I have seven, I've, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, rejection hurts, man. Like sometimes like, oh man, I go eat like donuts and chocolate milk and make myself feel better. And that is something you deal with, right? I mean, no one likes to feel like that they're not accepted or that they're not being listened to. There's always buyer's resistance. You guys just hit that. It's like, hey, can I help you find something? Start, no, man, we're good. Like, don't ask me another question. Like that is built into us. And it's almost, you know, we're, we're approached so many times a day, right? That if we said yes to everything, you know, we wouldn't have any money and you guys wouldn't be able to function as human beings. So there is that to keep us safe. Now, when you guys are in sales and you guys have a career in sales, it's like, man, don't take it personal. Well, that's easier said than done. And it's something that you just have to regularly do. That's why people get, there's high turnover in sales. It's like, go talk to an insurance agency. It's like, how many reps have you gone through in the last five years? 20, 50? There's a lot. And it's the rejection right? So it's, it's a couple things. Try not to take it personal. It's how do I do that? Well, you say, well, they have that buyer's resistance. There's a lot going on in that person's mind. You get a bad email back. You get a bad interaction with a customer. It's like that guy could have just had a big fight with his wife, could have found out his kid's sick, got two hours of sleep last night. You just don't even know what people are going through. And so that's helpful. Um, I'm going to recommend another book. Do you guys remember the first one? Did anyone write it down? So good so good they can't ignore you so second one obstacles the way cheesy title but it's written by a guy named brian holiday he wrote another book ego is the enemy stillness is the key anything and in these books they're they're easy to read they make sense but uh, obstacles the way that kind of introduce you this idea of stoicism and how you can process negative emotion so that that to me has been super helpful so hey. well we are cutting it close on time but we probably have Maybe time for one more question if we have any follow-ups. If not, I'll hand it over to the man of the hour who is, is now back. <laughs> questions, come on. They asked a lot of great questions, so. Hi, my name is Brock. I'm a marketing student also involved in sales. Um, just as a nice ender, what's your favorite part of your job? Why do, you go to, why do you go to school? Why do you go to work every day? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, real quick before I answer that, I do want to say I know that we're all like, oh, like just brush off the no and made it seem really easy. There are some days where I'm having a bad day and someone yells at me on the phone. I can feel like a teardrop. I'm like, I'm trying so hard. So just know like we make it seem easy. There are some days I'm like, please don't look at me. I'm like crying at my desk. It's a hard day. So trust me, like we, you know, there are hard days and it's not as easy as we make it seem. Um, but my favorite part about my job, um, I will say that I think it's the, he hit on it pretty well when um, he talked about why you take a company. And I feel like it's the excitement of getting to see where I get to move forward. Um, I love learning in my job and I learn so many things every day and I get sometimes I'm like oh like I want to be in this position and I feel like it's important to realize when you're in that job understand it to the best of its ability um, but I, I get excited to see like I'm one of those people that I want to be at Adobe for 10 15 20 years like I want to move up the chain I think it's such an amazing company and I want to just continue to grow there and so that's something that makes me really excited because I can feel like I'm adding value to this company um, and so I don't know I get really excited about that and with that being said I think that it's so important that when you get into a job or even school like letting the people know where you want to be I remember I got into my position and um, my manager laughed at me because I'm in there two weeks and I was like listen I know this is where I'm at, I'm, I'm going to work so hard, but my end goal is to be, my first end goal is to be a manager. I said, whatever I can do to continue to move forward to become a manager at this, you know, at this company, whether it's in four, five, ten years, that's my end goal. And so I just want you to know that, and that's, I'm going to work every day really hard in my position and the position after that and position after that so that I can get to that position. Letting people know is so important because if you don't tell them, I want to work for this company, or I want to be a manager, or I want to be an account executive. They have no way of helping you get there. And so that's something that's super important. But yeah, I just feel like 
I get excited about moving forward in the company and seeing where I can more add value and helping my team. I love, you know, sometimes if I'm busy and someone asks me a question, I'm like, I got stuff to do. But most of the time, I'm like, I would love to help you. Like, this is what's worked for me. And that's just in my personality. I love talking with people. But, nope, that's, I think, would be my favorite part. I kind of the same. I like that my leaders are invested in my personal growth. Um, so my... I was a brand new manager, like still working the Australian book. I was very stressed out, and um, my VP of sales came to me and was like, so where do you want to be in a year? And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, because I was still like just drowning in all the work. Um, but now we have biweekly meetings, and we're making sure that I'm on the trajectory of being like a director, then VP, and doing what I want to do. So that's been really um, something that I appreciate. And we get to have dogs at work, so that's kind of fun. So. <laughs> Yeah, an instructor I really like. So they focus a lot on your career Everest, and that's like your highest, you know, your pinnacle of your career. And I just really like um, the people I'm surrounded with at instructor. How everyone is focused on my growth, and there's opportunity for growth within the company. So for me, just on a day-to-day -day basis, coming in, being able to to work and develop and grow every single day, I think to me. You know, because I'm still new. I, like, I've been graduated for a few years, but, you know, being in sales, I'm still fairly new. So for me, just being able to grow, have that opportunity, and, and to really see myself growing every single day is, is one of my favorite parts about going to work, to see certain problems or certain things that I couldn't overcome two months ago that now I have an easy solution for, and I've built that in, and now it's just like a ritual. It's a habit. So I think having those things that, like, just watching myself grow has been really cool and, and, and seeing the opportunity that I have to continue to grow and, and you know, instructor is really great because it's, it's, I feel like I'm myself there, but you know, you don't have to be tied down to one company and they don't force you to stay, you know, so I think that's really great too that I can, uh, that I have that freedom if, you know, no one's going to look down on me if, if I decide to move to a different place, so that's something else I like about What's it. What's your Everest? My career Everest? Well, I actually want to be a, a real estate investor, so that's where I want to <laughs> end up. So um, sales is a great way to go about that route. I'd like to add, as a manager, like, sorry, as the manager, like, the best part of my job is seeing someone like you that's, like, two months ago, you would have no idea how to talk to this advertiser about their problems <laughs> and solutions, and look at you talking about attribution windows and all this, like, mm -hmm. it's so cool, like, to see the growth. That's the best part about being a manager, so... It's good to have managers who like that stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I enjoy celebrating the small victories. Um, you know, with, with my career, I get to go in and help people solve problems. And uh, yesterday morning, I was in uh, with a very small family owned company. And he's like, I don't have a lot of time, so it's got to be quick. And I said, okay. And so went through a couple things. And all of a sudden, he's like, well, wait a minute, you, you could do that? And I'm like, yeah. And so I ended up solving a problem for him. And he was so excited um, uh, about that. And I'm not going to make a lot of money off this. It's going to be a one-time small thing. But for him, it was huge. Um, and so I love those. And I, I get excited about those. Um, I was telling Mata earlier uh, about a huge thing I was helping Stryker with that they've been dealing with for two years um, and they've spent millions of dollars and I went in and solved it in about an hour for a couple thousand dollars and it, it was like that was like a huge wow this is really cool so Judge Moore, what are you doing? <laughs> Come on. Yeah. Um, so just celebrating the small victories I know we always want to have that big huge victory but just enjoying it and, and just have fun uh, with the people you're around. That, that's a big thing for me is um, I, I, I enjoy being around people and I want to have fun uh, with them. Great. Well, well, the question was how do we stay excited? What's your favorite part? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Dr. Brooke? 
I'm going to give you 10 seconds, Cash, 10 seconds. Uh, favorite part, man, uh, ultimate responsibility. Get married, have kids. There, there you go, man. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, it, well, maybe that's what gets me up. Favorite parts, helping, making a difference, getting, setting goals, right? We're goal-achieving creatures, right? So set goals, make plans to achieve them. So. 10 seconds. <laughs> Can Paige have 10 seconds? Yes, Paige gets 10 um, seconds, too. Um, I'd say small victories, too, like, I send hundreds of emails to really high level people at really big companies that it just like goes through and they don't see it and I kind of just brush it off. But when something works, it's like the best thing ever. And it's so little, it's setting a meeting with a VP and opening new business is so exciting for me. Um, like we sent out these, or our marketing department sent out these mailers that were just kind of dorky and funny to try and get them to talk about one of our, our products, you know, open conversations. And I've been emailing this guy for months, trying to talk to him. And finally emails me back. I sent him one of these boxes and it's like this dorky, like hot air balloon thing in this giant box. And he emails me, he's like, like, hmm, big box, interesting. like big box really bad for the environment and kind of goes on about really how bad this mailer was but at the end of the email he's like but I'll talk to you like let's meet and that's just like the biggest one in the world and there could be 200 failures but like those little one things are they, they make my week they, they just make my week so I love that Folks, this has been very edifying. Hopefully you've taken some great um, principles and some great examples. These are your peers. These are your Huntsman and Utah State peers that we encourage you to connect with and envision yourself that you'll be in these shoes very shortly. Let's thank the panel for being here.